R so thanks for chatting to me, Chris. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, I've followed your podcast for ages, actually, and um, and just your stuff online. So it's it's really nice to to chat to you. Yeah, man. Likewise. All uh, right. Well, I just uh be pretty cool to start from the start really how you started playing music and uh yeah how you started playing music well i was suzuki trained from the age of five yeah yeah and then uh when i was in high school i did uh you know like the serious uh summer camps yeah Chita chautauqua and i got really got you know serious new when i was probably 13, 14, that I wanted to be a concert violinist. Right. And, uh, and then when I was about uh, uh, 16, I my friends were playing in a rock band. Yeah. And so I started, uh, I started playing electric bass and electric guitar in the rock band. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of jealous about my friends – because they just seemed to have a different perspective on music, and, they, and it seemed to be easy for them when it came to rock music and composing or songwriting or arranging or improvising. And that was kind of you know frustrating because I was the one that had had training for ten years. <laughs> you know, I was supposed to be the quote unquote you know trained musician, yeah. and these friends of mine they had had like no training or like yeah. you know two or three lessons, and they just they had a completely different orientation. So I kind of was thinking like, what's wrong with me? Right. You yeah. know, what's wrong with me? And then also I was really, the thing that we go to is classically trained musicians. We go to this assumption about ourselves, and we think like, okay, so I guess I just wasn't born a creative person, yeah. you know, like, like my friend is really creative and, and uh, they must've been born that way. And I must not have. So I was really like down on myself thinking I'm not a creative person. And, uh, but then I decided I wanted to push against that. I wanted to try. I thought, well, maybe if I try, I could learn about music in a different way. And, and I could, you know, discover that I have something creatively to offer. So that was sort of when my, I sort of added like a separate, um, element of music education at that time, you know, through, whether through the rock band and then through like writing songs on the piano yeah. and, you know, uh, singing songs and playing bass and guitar and, and then so there was kind of these two strands of my musical development that went on from that time where i continued to work on classical music and classical violin but i also started to you know work on these other strands and uh in that kind of more creative strand or um that evolved because i got a little bit bored with rock music or not not necessarily bored with it, but I just, I wanted new challenges in that arena. So I started to play electric bass later on in high school. I joined like the, the local college had a big band. So I was yeah. playing electric bass in their big band and learned to read bass clef and, you know, mm. uh, and then when I went to college, I was playing with like a blues band and I played in a fusion band and I played in another rock band and, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. So the, so this separate strand, this more creative strand, kind of took a life of its own even though i kept music and it was kind of like these two separate musicians inside of me yeah. like the creative side and the classical side and the last 30 years in some ways have been a process of kind of reconciling or integrating those different strands and yeah. and feeling like okay i'm just one musician and, and all these different things are a component of that same musician even though obviously when we're in different contexts, um, mm -hmm. it requires different things of us. I mean, if I go play Tchaikovsky, it's going to require certain focal points, certain focus um, versus when I go play in a straight ahead or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I will say that I feel like playing jazz and, and other kinds of music and, and, and working on other skills has really informed my approach to classical music as well uh -huh. and i and i don't think most people realize or it's not the first thing people think of 
you know, they think if anything, <laughs> you know, playing jazz or playing other kinds of music is going to ruin your classical, yeah. you know, play, you know, but I think it, it actually ultimately will help your musicianship. Now, I will cop to the fact, however, that my chops on the violin are not what they were when they were 19. <laughs> and and it's, they're definitely, when it comes to playing Tchaikovsky, they're definitely a different kind of chops as well. Like, because I don't focus on vibrato and I don't focus yeah. on the same kind of bow strokes or, you know, so, yeah. so if I, if I was to bring out Tchaikovsky, you know, I'd have to go back to a lot of those, those things that I don't necessarily focus on in my practice today, whether it's vibrato or a certain kind of way using the bow and, yeah. and, and that can feel rusty, but, but also you can, you know, I, I take heart, when I have had to do that, that I can get it back pretty quickly if yeah. I focus on it. It's Cause you know, we were, we were, we were taught how to work on that stuff. So uh -huh. I don't feel like it goes away. Even if, even if you get rusty, I feel like you can always bring that stuff back if you need to. Yeah. How, how far did you go with the, with the classical stuff then? Like with your classical playing? Well, I'd like to say that I went really far with it. I mean, yeah, I, you know, I played, I worked on some of the Paganini's. Right. Okay. I could play. I could play some of the Paganini's pretty well. I, could, I, could, I don't. I'm not gonna say I could play all of them, mm -hmm. but I've done a lot of the the major concerto repertoire, and I've played. You know, I still occasionally play classical stuff, even with the orchestra. I have something on my YouTube channel of me playing two movements of the Lalo Symphony Espanol, so you can mm -hmm. kind of hear classical stuff there. And and even when I played Rautenberg's jazz violin concerto with the Muncie Symphony Orchestra, that's online as well. Scott mm -hmm. Rautenberg's concerto for jazz violin. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that are really in that piece that really require a classical um, sensibility. Yeah. So so I, I feel like I, I kind of hold on to that. But but yeah, I went very far as a classical violin player. I, you know, I, I was it was very serious. I would say it that way. And there was quite a long time you're saying that you were you kept the the classical violin up and you didn't integrate the fact that you were you didn't integrate that with the other styles that you're playing on like bass and guitar i think that in my own mind it seemed like separate worlds yeah you know what i mean and um it it just seemed like okay i'm putting one hat on now and i'm putting another hat on mm -hmm you know, at this other time. Yeah. And it was like it's completely different ways of looking at music. And I feel like that's over time it's become resolved. Like yeah. I don't I don't feel so splintered yeah. <laughs> about about my own relationship with music as okay. I did back then. Yeah. Um where, so when was it that you did decide to uh to sort of start putting the two together and, and start playing different styles on the violin? Uh I'm sorry. Sorry. When was it that you did actually decide to put the you know, put the two together, basically. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess when I was about 18, I um, somewhat, you know, I, I, well, probably even 16 or 17, I was like trying to transcribe, like, I remember like Led Zeppelin, I was really Led Zeppelin. So I was trying to like, trying to like imitate Robert Plant on yeah. the violin. Yeah. And you know, it's really hard to imitate a vocal melody. Yeah. It's like one of the hardest things to do, especially yeah. like rock in like rock music, because the melodies, the melodies are like, na, 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 you know, or, so it's like I mean, it's the most you know boring melody, but there's like so much power in it when it's with the singer. Yeah, and I was like, how can I? That's why music is so crappy, you know. Yeah. But um, but anyway, I, uh, I mean, I was trying to bring the the vibe. I was trying to, and I also transcribed a lot of like Jimmy Page solos and Jimi yeah. Hendrix solos and Eddie Van Halen and. <clears throat> and so in that sense I was I was integrating the violin but it was still in my mind it was just I don't know it was yeah. like just different worlds yeah so what what made what made you uh what made you you know start doing doing it on the violin um I think well I think just you know, I was playing it on guitar and bass, and then there was sometime there was this opportunity mm -hmm. to do something. And my buddy who played the guitar, he says, "Why don't you play? Why don't we do Stairway to Heaven, and you play it on the violin? Yeah, and I'll and I'll play the guitar part. And yeah, it was like this opportunity to perform. And 
I had I had seen I think I saw the um, Kronos Quartet perform like a Jimi Hendrix yeah. arrangement in like 1987. Yeah, and I was like, oh yeah, but I was already I already had the idea that like the vi- like I, that I could be like a rock guitar hero on yeah. the violin. <laughs> So I already had this idea, but I didn't have a, a distortion pedal yeah. or, or an electric violin yet. So that was a disconnect. So mm-hmm. it was a series of things that helped me integrate it over time. Yeah. So when did you find uh, jazz? Um, yeah, I, I would say when I was, you know, in college, I started college a year young. I was like 17. And, and I would say that I joined this uh a couple things happened. I, I started working with this fusion band of young guys. And I also started working with this kind of rock guitar hero named Paul Brown in, in Columbus, who, who he was also very fusion. It was very complex and kind mm-hmm. of John McLaughlin kind of, you know, and, um, this kind of modish new orchestra. Yeah. So those, those things kind of got me into jazz. Like they were like a bridge, uh, from rock, and then even like I said, I played electric bass in the mm-hmm. big band orchestra for the college while I was in high school. But it didn't really, it didn't move the needle in my mind. Like it didn't really make sense. I was yeah. just doing it. I was just reading bass parts, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, but when I got excited about it, was in the fusion band, and then also working with Paul, the guitarist, and but it was still very much like a fusion context. Mm-hmm. And so that was when I was about eighteen. And I was also playing with this guy named Ronnie Taylor, who was a blues singer, and I was playing bass for him. And one day he asked me to pull up. Someone said, why don't you play something for Ronnie on your violin? Yeah. And he didn't even know I played violin. <laughs> and this was this much older cat. It was like real, you know, really um, like he was a blues man, yeah. like a real legit blues man in Columbus. And uh, and I pulled out my fiddle after the the gig one time. And he was like, boy, you should do that. That's, yeah. you know, he was like he was like really <laughs> excited about like I could tell he was really surprised. He was shocked yeah. when he saw me play the bow. And he was like and also that he thought it was cool. Yeah. Cause he had because I was like trying to play some things that I've been working on, like blues things. Yeah. And I and it was like he hadn't even I don't know, he just was really surprised and, yeah. and so but then I didn't really get into thinking more about playing straight ahead jazz. Until around that time, some of the guys in the fusion band and in, and in the uh, and in Paul's band would say like, "You should check out Miles, or you should check yeah. out Charlie Parker, or you should check out Coltrane." And I would listen to it, but to be honest, I didn't like it. Yeah, yeah. It just it just sounded like noise to me. And but but these were people that I respected that were telling me to listen to it, so I kept trying to listen. And we'd be all hanging out, and they'd be listening, they'd be. You know, they they seem like they liked it. They act like they liked it. They'd be like, "Oh, that's great," and I'd be like, "I don't really hear it, but I'm gonna yeah. try to, I'm gonna try to hear it." Yeah. You know, it was, it was again kind of like me trying to to connect with these musicians that I that I had a sense of like they're getting something that I don't get. Yeah. Like they're, they, it's like if somebody <laughs> you know, and uh, and I kind of wanted to be in on it. So yeah. I was I just continued listening to like you know, whatever Coltrane, Miles, whatever, whatever the different stuff was is straight ahead stuff. But it really was not, I was not feeling it yeah. at all, but I was listening and it started planting a seed. And then, you know, as most people know, when I was 20, I went to, to prison. And so yeah. I started playing in there with a lot of different musicians. And again, there were musicians in there that would, you know, they were interested in straight ahead jazz or mm-hmm. um, whatever it might be. And, uh, so I kept listening and I was practicing that stuff and, yeah. you know, I was, you know, yeah. So then it, and it just built from there. When I got out, you know, I was locked up for four years. When I got out at the age of 24, I started playing basically duo gigs yeah. with, you know, piano players and guitar players mm-hmm. in Columbus, Ohio. And I did that for about five years yeah. in Col- four or five years in Columbus, just playing like four or five nights a week, yeah. th- you know, th- three hours three hour duo gigs and I would just ask questions and, and learn and read tunes out of the real books. And, and I got a lot of development from, from that period, from, from, from doing that. And then, but I still didn't know what the, what the heck I was doing. I think, yeah. uh, 
and and if anybody hears any of my first couple albums or whatever it's it's pretty obvious i mean you know uh, <laughs> when did you start um, recording actually with how, how long after getting out of prison did you start recording i released an album the first the year after i got out okay and then i released another album the year after that and mm -hmm. i've made i've released like 15 albums yeah. the, you know the last in those 22 years mm -hmm. um so people can hear how naive how unformed my jazz aesthetic and my vocabulary and everything it's pretty clear um and i feel like yeah it's still still a work in progress but i feel like at least until i was 35 i was still like really a beginner in a lot of ways yeah well at least until i was 28 29 yeah and then when i went to new york i was around i don't know i guess i was around 29 or something like that when i went to new york yeah i think like i started a little little bit more fully formed yeah and uh if what would you say was it that that helped you fully form was there a was there something that changed in your head was there a just i don't know what yeah what was it how, how, how did well, you to change be, well to be honest i mean when i went to new york um I think that it had been the comp, you know, it had been a, a culmination of, of the years prior and me kind of having like, I don't know, as people say, like a come to come to Jesus moment, you know, yeah. with myself, like being like, wait, I'm not really playing the changes. Yeah. Like I'm just, I'm just BSing myself uh -huh. and just, you know, and I need, you know, when I got to New York, there was, there was kind of two things. I mean, first of all, people in New York were not all trying to be traditionalists. Yeah. They weren't all trying, like I had been working for many years to just prove that I could swing uh -huh. and per prove that I could learn like the, the tradition, the language, the vocabulary, play the changes. And when I got to New York, I realized that a lot of people didn't even really care about that. They were more about having an individual voice. Yeah. You know, it was much more about having a creative sound and sort of like, you know, being different mm -hmm. and being, being unique. And so I was, I was confronted by both of those things at the same time. Like I was kind of, I was kind of letting go of the fact that, well, I just need to prove that I can play the blues or prove that I can swing or prove that I can play changes. Yeah. And I need to, and I need to find a, a, a truly a voice. Um, but at the same time, I was kind of coming to grips with the fact that I, that I couldn't do any of those things as well as I thought I could. I, I couldn't play James and I couldn't swing and I, and I couldn't play the blues as well as I thought it would. So, you know, um, those things kind of happen at, at the same time, you know, I, I, and I kind of bared down and did some harder work on just fundamentals yeah. that I, that I needed probably between the age of 30 and 35. But at the same time, I also started to really, become more of an individualist and get like, for example, um, uh, meeting DD D. Jackson and, uh, David Murray, mm -hmm. uh, that was a really like a new, that was an aha moment for me yeah. because it, it was like very avant-garde and free. Yeah. And, um, and that was the moment where I realized that I could bring together the strands of, of, I guess, in a way, it brought me back to my natural classical, like the sensibility of just a freedom. Yeah. Like, because when I first started improvising on the violin, it was very in uninformed. And there would be times when I would just, you know, do a bunch of just atonal improvisation or classical improvisation or just like mm -hmm. improvising with the violin and with whatever sounds I could find. Because, you know, it's frustrating when you don't know harmony and you don't know form. And yeah. you're trying to improvise. Yeah. And so someday I was like, well, I mean, it would be hard because I couldn't play over a tune very well in the beginning. But I was like, but I can improvise what sounds like Bartok to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so then hearing these avant-garde jazz cats like Dee Dee and David Murray, I was – it kind of brought me back to that. I was like, wait, let me just play free and see what happens and let me get rid of all this this baggage of – of trying to play the changes or trying to play the language or trying to play the vocabulary, or trying to play the form. Yeah. Like there's so much freedom in that and hearing them do that, it kind of sparked me with that. And then there was a lot of that in New York. 
Mm-hmm. I forget the question. I forget what question I was answering. But uh, I asked. Um, well, you just, oh, yeah. you just said that you uh, you had uh, there was a point when you you really you progressed a lot, and I was just wondering what it was that made <laughs> you do that. I think I mean you answered it pretty well, <laughs> even though you forgot. Yeah, and so it was. I mean, along the way, you know whether it was Ronnie Taylor, Paul Brown, the fusion band, the guys in jail I played with, the piano players and guitar players I hired after jail to play duo gigs with, Mm -hmm. going to New York, you know, meeting these avant-garde cats, playing with Les Paul, playing with Bill Evans, playing with Daphnis Prieto, you know. uh, It was was really, it was people Mm -hmm. who who I met that inspired me to grow, to grow. Yeah. You know, whether it was a band leader Mm-hmm. who I had to work with or whether it was like just a musician that I connected with who was another sideman in the band. Yeah. So whenever I've met those people, I've kind of tried to glom onto them yeah. and learn, learn from whatever it is that, that they had to give me or that I was hearing in what they had to offer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously going to New York, it was like, there were so many examples. There were so many inspiring oh, yeah. musicians to hear. And when I first went to New York, to be honest, and I think this is kind of important, um, I really was uh, very skeptical about the sensibility in New York when I first got there. So, right. so in other words, like I thought I had it all figured out, and I was like, it's all about Columbus, Ohio, and playing the blues, and you know, swinging, and and then. Everybody in New York, they weren't about that. And there was this downtown scene and this free playing and this more adventurous stuff. And and I was like, it, that sounds like noise to me. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. And and so I was kind of resistant to it. But after like a few years of being in New York, I started it started to really catch on for me and it started to make sense. And after eight, nine years, ten years being in New York, it became a part of what inspired me and 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 it it did really inform me so right okay um when did you start to uh get the idea for the creative strings program and the creative strings camps and things like that well i started the camp like 17 years ago so that was around 2001 um and uh actually my dad you know was a big support to me ever since the time I got out of out of jail. Him and my mom both had. When I first got out of jail, I said like I'm going to go work construction, uh-huh. and they and they said, "Well, are you sure you want to do construction? Don't you want to be a violinist?" And I was like, "Well, yeah, I want to be a violinist, but I have no idea how I'm going to make money being a violinist. So I guess I'm going to go work construction." And they were like, "Well, we'll help you. Like you can stay with us for a couple months, yeah. and we'll we'll teach you how to go." get gigs and one of the first things my dad recommended was that I go and offer like a one time free performance to these restaurants in Columbus and that's why within a month I had five nights a week playing in these restaurants and yeah. clubs and the best piano players and the best guitar players in town all wanted to work for me right because I had the gigs yeah and um and that's why I have such a big push to musicians about entrepreneurialism now, because if you can't play, if you can't, <laughs> you, know, you need a gig to go out and play. Yeah. So if you're not getting gigs, you're not going to be growing unless you're just in practice room playing all the time, which who can do that if you don't, if you can't make a living, yeah. you know? So, um, so it was again, like one of those talks with my dad and he said, Hey, Chris, I got an idea. And by the way, you know, I I had a child when I was, um, you know, just a year after I got out of jail. You know, my yeah. my first my first child was born, um, Camille, mm-hmm. who's now uh, twenty or yeah. twenty one, twenty one maybe. Jeez, that's embarrassing. She plays violin, know. right? Does she play violin? Yes, yeah. yeah. Cammy plays the violin, and, and so um, so it might have been, you know, that I was talking to my dad and that I was feeling financially pressured Mm -hmm. you know because when you have kids there's pressure and especially i was in new york going back and forth to ohio Mm -hmm. uh to to visit with my kid and you know um that puts a pressure on a person you know and uh so i think i was probably having one of those conversations with my dad because he was the person that i would go to a lot to be like dad how do i 
how do I pay my bills? Like, how do I make this work? You know, how yeah. do I get better gigs? And and one one of those times, I think he said, hey, here's an idea. Why don't you invite people to come here to Columbus and study with you for a few days? Mm-hmm. And you can even take them around to some of your gigs and show them what you do and you can work with them. To... And I was like, as usual, when my dad would give me these ideas, I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. And there's no way I could do that. And nobody, <laughs> nobody wants it. But, but usually my dad was right. And it was always the same. Like he would always, it was the same thing with the restaurant gigs. He was like, you should go do this. And I was like, you don't know anything about the music, you know, the music industry. No way somebody's going to pay me a hundred dollars. No way this is going to work, blah, blah, blah. But then I'd try it and it would work. Yeah. And, uh, so, so I said, okay, what the heck, I'm going to try it. And also like, I wanted to prove to my dad that I wasn't like a, you know, that I wasn't a wimp, you know, or that like I was going to at least try. Yeah. I had, I had to, sh- you know, that's the, that's the benefit that you get when you have someone in your life who provides that role of feedback and accountability, yeah. someone who ch- challenges you. And again, that's part of why I do music business coaching now is to provide that role to other people like mm-hmm. what my dad did for me yeah people people really underestimate it because they try to do everything on themselves and there's so many reasons why when you're just doing it by yourself you don't get anything done but when you got somebody pushing you yeah give, giving you feedback telling you when your ideas stink or when your ideas are great and you know anyway that's I, I guess you could say it's a soft pitch for my music business coaching. So I might as well just make it a, a, an explicit pitch, yeah, which is it. to say if people out there, if you're interested in that, you can, you can reach out to me. And if you're serious, I'll do a free consult with you. Mm-hmm. That's a free consult with, you know, with me. So there's no, there's no bait and switch, you know, so reach out to me if you want that Chris at Christian house.com. And if not, then shut the heck up, you know, don't do it. <laughs> so, you know, anyway, um, I think it was one of those conversations that was happening with my dad and he was like, you should do this. And then from that conversation, it's like, I felt challenged, but I also, you know, I felt this sense of like, okay, now I gotta, I gotta actually try Mm -hmm. to do this. And then, so I got like eight people to come and study with me for like, you know, four days or four or five days in Columbus. And then I took them around to gigs and, um, and it went well. And yeah. so then I was like, I'm going to do this. And then I just started building it and, uh, and stuck with it. But also around that time, I think I realized from, from looking around at like, cause if you look at the drumming world or the bass world or the guitar world, like some of those cats, like their whole audience is drummers and mm-hmm. bass players. Yeah. Or like somebody like Dave Weckl or Victor yeah. Wooten, you know, or, uh, shoot i don't know eddie van halen i mean well and i kind of thought maybe some i well the thing is i thought okay so people in the jazz world they totally discount me because i'm a violin player (laughs) all and all the people in the symphony totally discount me because i'm playing jazz and it's sort of like i'm kind of irrelevant to everybody yeah like nobody cares. Although, of course, there's also the flip side, which is that as a no- somebody who's novel, you know, and if I'm getting my own gigs, then I can I can capitalize on that. But but it kind of occurred to me, you know, someday there might be more violin players and classical musicians who are interested mm-hmm. in learning to improvise. And it's not necessarily that they're going to want to be jazz heads, mm-hmm. but but they may want to find the joy that you can get from going beyond classical training. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking, okay, so I, I, I could, I could try to teach anybody that wants that. And so that, you know, and the, and that first creative strings workshop kind of gave proof of concept Mm -hmm. that there were, there was a, you know, a handful of people in 2001 who were interested. And then I was like, okay, well, I can also go do workshops in schools. I can also, um, whatever, create training resources and all that stuff. And and I thought maybe someday that will be my audience because who the heck else is going to be my audience? Yeah. And, uh, and now 17, 18 years later, and that, that's really, I've, I've really solidified that idea. And actually I do feel that that's a big part of who my, the audience that I am speaking to 
is an audience of classically trained string players. And that's the, an audience that I feel I can best serve. Now, there are people who, like yourself, for example, who are more, maybe you might say more informed, and they they already know that they want to do jazz. You know, yeah. they've studied, studied jazz. There's more people like that than there used to be too, but that's a smaller yeah, still, you know, yeah. It's, it's, it's a smaller niche, but I, but I, I want to serve those people too, you yeah. know, so people who want to learn all the crazy jazz stuff, you know, teach them. but that's, did I answer your question? Um, yeah. I mean, my question was just, how did you start creative strings? So yeah, you tell yeah. Me you, yeah, yeah. You, you're giving me a, a good answer there. Um, are, hi, I seen that you have spent a lot of time with Billy Contreras. He's a guy who I've been really wanting to to think about getting on the podcast because he's uh, such an amazing musician. And also, I remember I last spoke to well when I last met Jason Anik. He um he said if, um that he thinks that Billy had a big impact on like your playing as well, and I just wondered if i could bring that up oh definitely yeah billy's amazing and he had a huge impact on me when when we started uh playing together around yeah 2000 we made a couple albums together yeah and um and that was that was a huge that that had a huge impact on me just kind of studying the way that he approached the instrument yeah yeah definitely yeah um yeah i've just uh listened to a bunch of his stuff and i really I really, really like. He's got his like own voice, doesn't he? Definitely. He's like, I don't know. I don't think many people, especially in the UK and Europe, have like, you know, know much about him. Probably mm -hmm. most of it, it would be through, um, through, uh, through your stuff. Maybe I don't know. Um, okay. So, in terms of your playing now, do you manage to keep a routine? Have you, well, have you ever kept a routine, a practice routine? Do you like routine? So um, from time to time, I'll get into more of a practice vibe. And then, you know, then there'll be times when I don't practice as much. Uh -huh. And I would say I tend to practice. I mean, there's definitely been times when it was like super intensive practice, you uh -huh. know. And then there's times when I don't practice at all, you know. Um, but in general, I will practice for a project, yeah. You know, if I have a recording, I'll practice for that recording. If I have a tour or a concert, I'll practice for that yeah. tour or for that or that concert. Yeah. And and at the same time, you know, you know, so so whatever project you're recording, it's going to require that I practice specific things for that. Yeah, yeah. You know, so like if whatever I'm playing requires that I have like a beautiful sound in an acoustic setting, then I'm going to work on my sound in an acoustic setting. Yeah. If it's going to be or conversely, if it's like going to require that I have like a bunch of effects together, then I might have to just spend time with my effects pedal and yeah, like figure yeah. out, you know, dial in my sound kind of like a guitar player. Um, if the tune is is written in, you know, uh, F sharp minor, then I'm then I'll work on. I work on F sharp minor, yeah, minor, yeah. just just for that tune, yeah. you know. Or if there's some gap that's exposed for me in a specific tune or a specific concert, then I'll focus on it. But I'll do the best I I'll I'll do that within a realistic yeah. understanding that there's really two goals. Well, the most important goal is to make the music the best that I can when I perform it. Yeah. So, so if I let's say that I had to play a song tonight in a concert. And there were just things in that song that were challenging for me. Well, I'm going to try to work on those things, but also realistically, I know I'm not going to master those things uh -huh, by tonight. Yeah. yeah. So you got to figure out a practical way to make the music as good as you can, which like the simplest way is to know, like to express this is to say to know when to lay out. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and it's also to speak to this difference between additive practice and subtractive practice. Mm -hmm. So, like, we tend to always focus on added, you know, additive practice. It's like, how can I play faster? How can I play more complexity, more language? You know, yeah. those are those are things that we're trying to add. But actually, most of us can be much better musicians in terms of the performance we give, the recording we make, 
you know, the thing that we share by subtracting. It's mm-hmm. by, by, by not playing when we shouldn't play. Mm-hmm. Oh. And so, so there's, there's really, I'm going to really always approach it from that standpoint. Um, you know, like a great example is, uh, well, there's lots of examples, you know, like, like here's a classic example. Let's say you've got like, somebody's going to play a fast swing tune at like 220 BPM or 250 BPM over like a rhythm changes, you yeah. know? And maybe it's in a key, you know, but maybe it's in a hard key, you yeah. know? So what the, the biggest mistake that most people make, and mm-hmm. like everybody makes this mistake, is that they just, they'll try to play like all, you know, like long, fast lines, like long streams of eighth notes, and they'll constantly wreck themselves because they're playing beyond their means. Sounds like me. I mean, I've done it a thousand times. That's why, you know, that's why we could talk about it. You know, I mean, it's like I've made that mistake so many times and it finally occurred to me, wait, if I just took, you know, if I just took my bow off the string and just didn't try to play that long string of eighth notes, like, yeah. like if I instead played just two, two eighth notes, yeah. every other bar, you know, I could play pretty much a perfect solo. Yeah. You know, so it's about playing within your means. But yeah. anyway, I, I kind of lost my string of thought there. Um, um, well, you were talking about practice. Yeah, I was so, just saying if you've got a routine, but I mean, that's fine. We were allowed to yeah. go off topic, don't we? Well, yeah. So so I'll 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 practice with these very specific goals yeah. related, related to projects. But also, I have like an idea of like what are the two or three things that I'm focused on mm-hmm. for the next like year. Yeah. Or two years. Like, like there was a time when I, I don't know, maybe I was like 32 or 33. I can't remember. But like, I realized that like, I sucked at playing melodic minor. And <laughs> that at the same time that melodic minor was like a really important sonic world for yeah. making, for making the, the kinds of sounds that I wanted to make and be, yeah. you know, be able to play a certain way. And so I just basically for like one or two years, the only scales I ever practiced were melodic minor scales. Yeah. And, um, and even if I picked up my violin for 10 minutes, like that's all I would do. It would be like, you know, and, and it would be like, okay, so this week I'm just practicing C sharp melodic minor in every position and every possible way, yeah. you know? And so after like one or two years, like, I got it. Like yeah. I got melodic minor and then it was just like a part of me. And so it's the same thing. It might be whatever it is that I'm working on. It's like, I need to work on intonation or I need to work on not playing the same licks. Yeah. Or I, I need to work on whatever that big idea or yeah. big ideas, like that'll be also a through line that I'll be thinking about for like maybe a couple of years and just, just returning to those things. Okay. So there's like persistence, of 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 small of ideas basically as opposed to having a you know oh every day i do this hour and i do this specific thing every day you know specific thing in that time it's more like you you keep you keep persisting with that one thing yeah i think it's about really it's really about problem solving so uh-huh. you know if we're going to talk about practice i'll say other couple other things that are related to it so um the first thing along the lines of what we were just talking about, I think a lot of people are like, okay, I'm working on diminished scales, melodic minor scales, bebop scales, pentatonic scales, major scales. And that's like this routine they do, like of scales every day. And I think now that I would recommend to students don't do that. Instead, pick one sonic world, work yeah. on it for like two, three months. Like if you like you could, like any of those are arguably important like sonic worlds for jazz. Yeah. You know, pentatonic bebop uh i mean dominant bebop major bebop minor pentatonic yeah you know uh uh diminished yeah. whole tone and melodic minor those are the biggies yeah um but the thing is if you're working on any of those just work i would say maybe just work on one yeah for like a few months yeah. and cover it in different keys and work on it just like on a couple keys you yeah, know yeah. and then work on more keys 
and then take another one. And I think that that really hurt me in the early part because I was work, trying to work on all those scales at the same time. And I don't mm. think you retain as much. Yeah, no, yeah, I can understand. It's subtractive again, eh? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if it's the same. I don't know if I would consider it part of the same idea the way I refer to subtractive. Okay. I think I would, but maybe it is. But I mean, I think my point is more about what is going to help you retain information faster and deeper. Yeah. And I think working on six different types of scales at the same time a little bit every day does not help you retain any of them. Yeah. As well as picking one and working on it for three months. So that's a different to me, in my mind, that's a different issue. It's about yeah, yeah, how yeah. how can I master this one thing better? Mm -hmm. And uh and let's face it, um, Matt, I mean, for for most I think for most jazz violin players or jazz musicians in general, it's a battle of retention. Yeah. It's a battle of it's a battle of like how can I, you know, there's this concept, I'm hearing it, I don't understand it, I can't internalize that information. How can I internalize it faster? Yeah. And that has to do with like prioritizing and figuring out your work, yeah. your work, your workflow such that you're actually making progress. And people, they suffer because they're just scattered and overwhelmed. They yeah. don't know what to work on. And there's no continuity in it. There's, and there's no, <clears throat> and I'm speaking, I mean, I'm talking about myself, you know, this is, this yeah. is what I went through. And, and I think it's the same for a lot of people. Cause I, now I teach a lot of students and, uh, uh, I lost my train of thought again, but you're just saying, and we were just talking about, <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to do that. Isn't it? It's fine. No, but we we're just talking about, you know, taking small ideas and running with them within your practice schedule, you know, not, sure. not trying to do too much thing, too many things at once. Yeah, really sticking with it. Well, I know the other thing I was going to say. It's it's that you've got to consolidate. You, when you practice, you've really got to practice smart. Mm -hmm. And most of us, if we if we had good classical teachers, we did learn to be smart practicers. But we also, for all of us, there's an, there's this spectrum when we practice on one side where we're just going through the motions and making absolutely no progress whatsoever in anything. Yeah. And on the other hand, where we're really having these deep breakthroughs. Yeah. And, and so the trick is that every time you practice to make it quality, I'd rather, I'd rather practice less, but make sure that when I do practice, uh, it's I'm really getting something from it. So what's your goal? Yeah. You've got to have a goal when you practice. Like, you know, my goal is I want to play better in tune. Okay. So then whatever you do, you focus on playing better in tune and you, and you, and you, at the end of that practice session, you're like, did I fix it or not? You know, or playing faster or fixing your bow arm. These are classical or technique things, right? Yeah. But when it comes to internalizing harmony or or being more creative or developing more vocabulary, you have to have the same intentional, yeah. the same level of, of purposeful practice. And so, so two things. One is consolidate. Mm -hmm. If you're doing, if you're working on intonation, then you should be working on into, like, let's say it's slow intonation practice mm -hmm. or slow, like, you know, bow control practice. Yeah. If you're working on that, you should also be consolidating with it improvisation. Uh -huh. People don't do that. They're like, okay, I'm going to take a half an hour and just work on my old technique exercises. Yeah. And because I know how to do that, but it's like, no, no, no. Do the same technique exercises, thoughtful, be thoughtful about your technique, yeah, but incorporate improvisation. Okay, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. And, and also that brings me to my pet peeve about warm-ups. Warm-ups suck. For most people, warm-ups are crappy because they just go, they just regurgitate the same warm-up exercise. There's yeah. no thought to it. And the only thing it does is warm up their fingers, Yeah, which is good, right? I mean, it's a good thing to warm up your fingers. Sure. But again, you should get more out of that warm-up. It should be more thoughtful. So do change your warm-up. Mm -hmm. Incorporate improvisation into your warm-up. Put a, a key signature you're not comfortable in your warm-up. Instead of playing your warm-up in C, play your warm-up in D flat. Yeah. You know, for three weeks, and then you you warm up in in F sharp. Mm -hmm. That is going to make your practice time count so much more. So you you like incorporating uh, different different uh, like different issues into into your into one thing. You you don't like practicing intonation on its own, 
improvisation on its own, chords on your on their own. You think it's better to put it all into make make your own little uh, exercises. Yeah, like like because if you're practicing intonation, mm-hmm. well, how you know how are you practicing intonation? If you're practicing intonation out of a flesh or Galamian book, uh-huh. then then my teacher used to say to me, a scale is a means to an end. Uh-huh. You know, you're practicing a scale for a reason. You're not practicing a scale because of the scale. Yeah. You're practicing a scale for a reason. So what's the reason? It's either intonation, mm-hmm. bow control, mm-hmm. sound projection, or shifting. Yeah. You know, or in our case, we've got more things that we can combine. You're practicing a scale so that you can uh, internalize the relationships in that scale yeah. better. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's like, well, I'm going to practice a scale – to learn fourths or I'm going to yeah. practice a scale to practice like double stops playing sevenths yeah. or I'm going to practice a scale using this like triple stop, like bow thing. Yeah. You know, so it's giving more goal. you like, it's really having an intention with the scale. And if you're just playing the same scale that you've done for 20 years, just to work on intonation, that's like, you're not getting the most out of that time. Yeah. You can still work on intonation, but you can be improvising yeah. or be, you know, and that's more, can, it's it's more critical thinking. It's more actually solving problems. You know, we've got to we've got to kind of one up mm-hmm. our look. And I think about this a lot with personal development too, mm-hmm. or business, or fitness, or practice. It's not enough to just pick up your violin and just play some exercises. Yeah, you've you know, it's your responsibility. It's my responsibility. It's each of our responsibility to say like. This is my goal. Yeah. I want to play more in tune or I want to be able to not play the same three licks, you know, or I want to be able to play in C sharp melodic minor. All right. Well then how am I going to accomplish that goal? Okay. So I'm gonna do it this way or that way. When you take more responsibility Mm -hmm. and you set goals and you declare those goals to somebody else. And ideally if you pay for it, that's where you get the most accountability, you know, (laughs) then you start to take more responsibility, mm-hmm. you know, and just sitting around instead of just sitting around saying the same thing. And again, I'm talking, these are my own self talk here. All right. <laughs> I'm not trying to talk down to everybody else out there. I'm saying these are the struggles I've gone through. Yeah. And I realized I was sitting around just complaining about why I hadn't learned melodic Meyer scale. It's like, well, yeah, you know, don't yourself, why don't you do something about it, you idiot? You know, it's like quick complain about it and like take some responsibility. Yeah. And I still, yeah, over 20, 30 years, I've really questioned these things. Mm-hmm. And and teach and working as a teacher with other people has helped me to be more honest with myself about it too. I'll be, uh, you know, and that's also part of why, again, why I started doing this music business coaching, mm-hmm. coaching, you know, because it's the same thing. It's It's personal development. Yeah. Is how do I, how do I get better? How do I change my career? Like you, like you doing this podcast, man. It was like a lot yeah. of like I, you know, kudos to you because like, you know, you're like I'm going to do this, and now you're you're still doing it, and like you took action. It's like yeah, people. A lot of people they're just they're just stuck. Whether it's about practicing or whether it's about moving their career forward or whether it's about you know whatever fitness relationships. So yeah. I mean, as I get older. And the more that I've been a teacher or now a coach, it's 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 always making me think about this aspect of, of personal development and whether it relates to being a better musician, whether it relates to all those other things I just mentioned, being a better dad, you know, yeah. whatever it is. But having this taking responsibility and then like really having clear goals and then um, being accountable for like trying to find a better way to accomplish those goals. Uh, was there was there like a moment that that this idea became clear to you, or did, like the idea behind what you just said, or do you feel like yeah? When do you feel like this that became clear to you? It's been gradual, but I mean, um, you know, I I I mean, over the years, well, it's really since I was fifteen, I I had you know on different occasions, I've I've gone to therapists. Uh-huh. And I think working with therapists helped me. I think that when I was in jail, I studied a lot of philosophy and psychology, and yeah. that that helped me to be more thoughtful and, and inquisitive and reflective. Um, and then, 
various moments uh, in the last 30 years, you know, whether whether I've gone back to therapy, whether it was about myself or about a, an issue or just have various crises in my life, you know, like, like, you know, hey, I can't pay my bills. What the heck am I do about it? So I ask somebody and I get advice from somebody who makes me think about it. And then a few years ago, my brother, my little brother um, started doing Lewis House is his name. And he has uh -huh. this, a, a, a podcast called The School of Greatness. It's famous. It's a huge Right. It's famous podcast. It's really about personal development. Um, we, I, you know, even before that, I had influenced Lewis, and because I was always reading more books about business development. Uh -huh. But as I read more and more about how to improve my business, yeah, it started to, it naturally starts to talk about these concepts that yeah. are just through and through of personal development. Mm -hmm. And then I shared those with Lewis and then he was doing great in his career. And then I was getting inspired by him. And then <laughs> one time he, had, he suggested that I go to like this immersive retreat and I got some, you know, like a five day retreat, you know, with like a, somebody who was, you know, so I was just picking up skills and picking up perspectives, whether I was reading about it, whether I was in, you know, um, getting training or getting mm -hmm. counseling I've paid consultants before, you know, for help. And yeah, so all that has been leading up until in the last couple of years. I just realized like, this is where I'm going, mm -hmm. you know, I, and I, and also I realized like I wanted to integrate it all. Like I don't want to be afraid to talk about, because I think it was very shy to reveal, um, who I, who I really am, mm -hmm. you know, to, to like my audience in some ways. And, and part of that is like being a jazz musician. Yeah. Like you're just, you're in a jazz culture and you want it, when you start being a jazz musician, you just want to be accepted as a real jazz musician. So you sort of start wearing <laughs> you yeah. know, all the affectations and just like trying to be like a, a true jazz musician and, and all the models of jazz musicians. Well, a lot of them are not, I mean, yeah, a lot of other people that we see, they're just doing the same thing. They're trying to be what they think a jazz musician is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And a lot of jazz musicians are starving. Yeah. A, a lot of jazz musicians are not able to sustain healthy relationships. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of jazz, you know, I mean, and of course there's, there's one, there's a lot of great jazz musicians that, that I've learned a lot from, but I started, I realized, um, I don't need to prove something to anybody else. And, and and honestly, leaving New York yeah. was was an important time for me because it was really hard to leave New York. Because when you're in a place like New York, you feel like this is the only place that I could possibly be. And you get all your sense of like affirmation from everybody else in New York that yeah. you've you've risen on the ladder to be worthy of friendship with or playing gigs with. Yeah. And so leaving is like this feeling of like you know, are people going to think I'm a failure? Am I not going to have friends anymore? Am I not going to have any good gigs and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And so I had to really kind of reclaim my own sort of independence yeah. in a deeper, in a deeper way <clears throat> and, and realize that it's up to me to define my life and like, you yeah. know, what that looks like to other people. So, um, and so over the years, it's been about, again, integrating, sort of being comfortable in my own skin and being well able to share all these things with my audience. And that's why you might, people probably noticed I put more of this coaching stuff out there in the last couple of years <laughs> and, and hinting at these questions of personal development. Whereas there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be like, you know, fuck off, dude. I, all I care about, you know, all I care about is play the bebop scale. I want to hear about this fucking bullshit, yeah. you know? But, you know, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm the more I'm becoming a, you know, truly like a grown person, yeah. it's like I want to be authentic. I want to show up exactly and say exactly what is on my mind and and um and try to bring these separate strands together. And frankly, you know, the whole talking about the prison thing too you know that's been a source of like 
it's been like a, a dichotomy for the last or you know this kind of duality of like shame and also pride mm -hmm. you know for me for years it's like it's something that um you know i guess is an interesting story to people and so that people might think that's useful or you know some way yeah. but also but also it can really repulse people and it can be it can put me in a very vulnerable place and especially you know when you share things with people yeah and I tend to be an oversharer, Matt, if you haven't noticed. Um, but but then sometimes, you know, I can feel really vulnerable and it's almost like re-traumatized mm -hmm. after you share things with people and you feel like maybe they're not gonna receive that. Yeah. And um so so I've really gone back and forth between between sort of being like scared about talking about it or like just yeah. like worried about what people think about it and on the other hand like really you know sharing it yeah. and and i feel like as i get older and you know where this is all going for me is that i need to be just really authentic yeah and and so really you know comfortable in my own skin and being able to share whatever i want to share on my own terms yeah and for and people to be able to get from that what they get from that and if they don't that's cool too you know we we don't need to be you can unsubscribe from my email or you don't need to hire me if if it doesn't you know yeah and and so i'll probably be talking more about that stuff too because honestly it's not just you know i don't want to be that guy that's like the cliche war veteran that is always telling the same war stories, you know, when he's 75, you know, yeah. there's sort of a cliche about that. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, a lot of the opinions or ideas or lessons that I've learned, a lot of my pedagogy, a lot of the reasons I do things the way that I do them, it has to do with lessons that I learned there you know seeds that were planted there and it's just a part of it it's just a context i mean if somebody asks me why do you play the violin the way you play the violin honestly i cannot give you an honest answer mm -hmm. if i don't explain if i don't explain those four if i don't mention those four years in jail yeah yeah if someone says why do you believe why do you teach the way you teach why is you know why are you so bullish on entrepreneurialism well the reason i'm bullish on entrepreneurialism is that the only reason the only way that i could possibly have had a, a career as a jazz violinist was by creating it for myself yeah because nobody was going to hire me mm -hmm. and the only way that i could have created it by myself was by taking lessons from my dad the salesman Mm -hmm. And the only reason that I possibly ever could have followed through on that was because I had a fucking gun to my head, dude. Yeah. Like I, w I had a fucking gun to my head. I was still serving six to 25 years when I got out of jail after four years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the amount of trauma and the PTSD that came with that, it was either going to curl up in a fetal ball and yeah. give up or I was going to fight with everything I had to go out there and survive. And that is such a part of who I am. I can't, I can't explain to you how I can, I, why it's important without mentioning that I can't, you know, why is playing jazz violin important and why is changing the culture of music education, classical music education important? I cannot tell you that without talking about my experience in prison, because when I was in prison, I realized that my experience, the, the sliver of experience that I had had as an educated, college-educated, middle-class white dude in America, that, that that was just a very, very tiny, tiny, tiny perspective on the world. And that by going to prison, I realized that there's all these people in the world that didn't have that education, and, and they yeah. come from completely different backgrounds. And that and I really saw how fucked up, yeah. you know, it is for some people in the United States. And, um, you know, and, and that's why changing classical music education is important to me because 
classical music education is complicit in the imperialism, in the, you know, cultural imperialism um, in America, on the ongoing oppression of marginalized groups, whether they be African Americans, Latinos, women, you know, and LGBTQ. Yeah. And my opinion about all that shit cannot be divorced from those four years that I spent in prison. And that's the fucking reason I care about, you know, changing music education. Yeah, and that's and it's and it's and it's the reason that my perspective is unique and powerful to this to the degree that it is, and it's what I have to to contribute. So I'm gonna so I'm done fucking apologizing for it. Yeah, man, I'm really it's it's great that you do it. It's great that you do share. Thanks, um, brother. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because from the outside, I'm a middle class white boy who's just really it's always been fine didn't go to prison you know learn learn music tried to learn music and you spend so much time in your head thinking oh you know, you're giving yourself exactly excuses ah uh, well the reason i don't play this well is because it's because of this and actually hearing a story like yourself like yours can be really helpful to help you combat that yourself you know you go oh, chris howells went to prison and uh, plays the way he does. I don't really have any excuse <laughs> because I'm saying, oh well, I didn't, <coughs> I didn't practice enough when I was a kid, so uh, that's why I'm not able to. It's like, no, man, you know, come on, you can sort it out. You're fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I appreciate that, and I will say that also, you know, guys like you and me can can be in a we can find ourselves in a different kind of dilemma as well, where we we kind of might be tempted to apologize for our background or for our training. And, and I also have realized over time that that was a mistake that I was making. Like I was really yeah. kind of, you know, kind of, I felt like a walking apology for a long time. Uh -huh. And... And so in some ways I've, I've wanted to come back and be and kind of reclaim my, my training. Like I am a classical musician. I love classical music and, yeah. and therefore I don't have to conform to a definition of jazz, you know, yeah. which I'm never, and also I, not just, just feeling bad about whoever I am. Like yeah, there's yeah. a way, there's a way to take yeah. a stand about whatever change you want to see in the world or whatever stand you want to take with without apologizing no, I for agree. yourself i totally agree i i really do agree with that actually that really resonates i do agree with that a lot um apologizing for yourself is a is a stupid thing an awful thing and too many people do it yeah yeah man um wow wow that's uh <laughs> That's, that's inspiring, though. It really is. And I really hope that it's inspiring for other people. Because if, if it, yeah, it's inspiring for me. And actually, to be honest, that's actually why I do this thing anyway. <laughs> a lot of the time, I, th I, I, I said, well, I just realized recently that I think that this podcast can actually, there's probably some like form of therapy jazz violin therapy for myself <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh, which we need brother <laughs> you know and, and by the way you know i i will just i will just say to the listeners you know if anybody's offended by my cursing you know i, I no. it's not my it's not my intent to in to to offend but i will say that sometimes when i when i start talking about that period in my life it sort of brings it out because it was sort of like you know i kind of adapted a different persona in there and so it is it is yeah. sort of i kind of go between this very street <laughs> <laughs> you know, this kind of street convict you know there's that side of me that lives yeah. and then there's also this more like sort of refined you know philosopher side but but i do feel <laughs> i do want to be sensitive to like you know if there's like super young people you know in, yeah. in my audience or 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 people that are just you know offended by curse words but i just want to explain that that's part of why when I do try to share 
honestly, it, it sort of just comes out. So it's not my intent to offend. Yeah, I, I, that that definitely doesn't doesn't come across like that. Um, maybe I can put a, a parental advisory on on this episode. <laughs> well, that's up. That's up to you, man. It's up yeah, to you. Yeah. you. yeah, you can let them know. There's a few curse words, so yeah. if you're, you know, yeah, that might be a good responsible yeah. introduction. You know, but, maybe. Um, uh, I don't know. I I, might, I think that if uh, anybody who uh, is wanting to get into anyone who's wanting to get into jazz is probably going to come across some of these curse words anyway. Touche. Uh, good point. Good yeah. point. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, what time are we on? Uh, what What time do you have to go? I, I got to go in five minutes. In five minutes. Well, it's a good time to round up. Um, what are your, is there anything that you're doing right now that you want to chat about? Your things you're up well, to? Well, thanks, man. I mean, you know, I already mentioned that I'm doing this in entrepreneurial coaching for people. So if anybody out there, if you want to connect with me, you know, reach out to me. Yeah. I, I am accessible. You know, uh, you can email me. You can find my probably find my phone number on my website and uh but you know i'm excited about the workshops we'll be in switzerland february 1 to, through the 3rd so anybody yeah. if you're in europe you know come hang out with me and baju bot oh that um, guy he's great oh yeah and and he's we're doing uh, like a european creative strings summit and it's near geneva in a town called lausanne switzerland we're doing a three-day workshop there and of course come to the States and, and come to the other creative strings workshops. We've got one in Canada. We've got some of the States. If you go to christianhouse.com, click education or just Google creative strings workshop or just reach out to me. Also my online mentoring, you know, it's the creative strings Academy. So anybody can right now you can sign up, you can take a free private lesson with me. You can get, you know, it's a free 30 day trial. There's really no reason not to do it. So, um, that's a way to, to connect with me. And on that 30 minute lesson that we do, which is free, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll work with you and I'll give you some feedback and give you some pointers. If you feel stuck and you're practicing or if it's hard for you to set goals, whatever it might be. So that's the stuff I'm doing. And just in general, you know, um, I'm excited to, uh, to connect with people. So anybody in your audience wants to connect with me, Hey, I want to serve. You know, it's, it's, as I get older, I, I, of course, I want to continue to be an artist. I want to be relevant as a player, as a composer, as a musician, but I also, I want to serve as a, I don't know, I want to serve as a connector in our community. And I applaud you for what that you're doing that Matt, you know, with this podcast. I mean, I really appreciate you for that. Thanks, man. The, the idea is really just to have a little space for, for violinists to find interviews with their favorite players so and because i it because i didn't have that when i was first starting and i wanted it and i right. sort of still want it you know <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah um so yeah cool well thanks man that was great it's really nice to chat to you likewise i appreciate you matt yeah uh speak soon all right see ya bye